Welcome to the 308th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with urban fantasy author Hunter Blaine, author of the Preternatural Chronicles. And also stay tuned for after the interview for a short excerpt from the audiobook of book three of the Preternatural Chronicles, Shadow of a Doubt. That's right after the interview. Stay tuned for the interview now. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. Listen to audiobooks during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro.fm app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. Reading and Writing Podcast Special Offer. Get two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership with code RWPODCAST. That's code RWPODCAST for two audiobooks for the price of one for your first month of membership at Libro.fm. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Hunter Blaine. Blaine is the author of the urban fantasy series, The Preternatural Chronicles. His latest novel is Mouth of Madness. Hunter, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me, Joe. Sure. If someone listening hasn't heard about Mouth of Madness yet, how would you describe the novel? Let's see. Well, the whole series, The Preternatural Chronicles, is a uh, you know a sequential series, kind of like uh, most urban fantasies out there, like Dresden Files, Iron Druid, uh, the Nate Temple series. Uh, so uh, book one starts with I'm Glad You're Dead. And um, readers are calling it uh, Deadpool is a Vampire, which is an excellent uh, <laughs> review, in my opinion, because uh, just the snarky humor, the anti-hero uh, vampire who's who's trying to use his powers for good and, uh, you know, wants to go to heaven whenever he takes the big, big sleep. So that was kind of a different take on uh, Immortals that I haven't seen before, which is, you know, um, one day everything's going to end. So where, where will a uh, vampire go whenever he dies? And do you remember the original idea that led you to write the Preternatural Chronicles? Yes, actually. Uh, this this is a this is a big one. So the series is starring uh, my best friend. His name is John Cook. Uh, he'd always liked my writing. We grew up together, and he was a musician, and I was a writer, and we just kind of fed off each other, uh, shaped each other into the people we are today. And he uh, one day made me promise to write a book about him. I said, sure, you know, what, what do you want to be? And he said he wanted to be a vampire, but not one of those sparkly ones. <laughs> so I, I agreed. And I, I made a promise to him. And then a couple of years after that, he uh, pulled a party foul on me and, and, and died. So uh, I had no choice but to kind of uh, hold true to my promise to my best friend. And I wrote the first book, uh, I'm Glad You're Dead, uh, just for me. But then, you know, I let my uh, closest friends kind of get a hold of it. And, and they really liked it. And, uh, and by the way, I'm glad you're dead is a, I know it's an interesting title for a book dedicated to your dead best friend, <laughs> but, it, but, uh, my series is full of movie quotes. So, uh, that's actually a quote from the 1989 Batman where uh, Jack Nicholson is uh, doing one of his monologues. So we used to quote that to each other all the time. So it was very appropriate. <laughs> that's great. Well, what are your earliest memories of reading in books? Um, goosebumps for sure. I remember devouring uh, R.L. Stein's books whenever I was younger and then uh, advancing to uh, Pierce Anthony with like the incarnations of immortality. That's still one of my favorite series today uh, just because of how good he is. And then, of course, you know, Stephen King and all that. But really, I, I would say uh, discovering Dresden Files by Jim Butcher. That's what really got me into the whole urban fantasy thing and just thinking like, wow, this this is amazing. So I've been uh, just inhaling urban fantasy series out there, like the Dresden Files, Iron Druid Chronicles is really good, especially the narrations by Luke Daniels. Uh, Luke Daniels also reads my books, by the way, so he's doing the audio. So I have an audible Hall of Famer reading my books, which is awesome. And then uh, like Sandman Slim. And then I took, for my series, I took the things that I love from all these other characters and put them into one, such as uh, Sandman Slim, the character's an anti-hero. He, he just leave him alone. Um, he's uh, he's going to kill the bad guys if they get in his way. Uh, that kind of thing. And then you have like the Dresden Files where you have 
the 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 wizard who's trying his best to be good and, and all that. So, but with an ever deepening storyline, I really like the Dresden Files because uh, the butterfly effect, something that happens in in book three later on, really comes down in book like nine, for example. So I, I incorporate a lot of the butterfly effect and foreshadowing in my series, which is which is awesome. And in order to do that, are you planning the series um, books in advance, or do you just go back and, and pick up um, uh, things that you can expand later? What's your process around that? A little bit of both, but um, I have the whole series planned. It's 13 books total. Uh, 13 because that was uh, John, John and my favorite number, uh, mostly because, like, you know, Friday the 13th and all that stuff. Um, but I have the series planned. I know exactly how it's going to end. Uh, and I can't wait to get to the end of book 12 and then to the end of book 13, uh, fans are going to freak out. That's for sure. But, um, and, but also as I'm, uh, I, I like to listen to Luke Daniels do the books because whenever you have someone, especially of that caliber read to you, even me writing the books, it's like I get to hear them for the first time. So I'll catch certain things, you know, you know, some, some minute detail, I'll think, I wonder what happens to that, and then I'll make sure to address it later on in the book. So it's it's really catching the small continuity things, or even just the small little Easter eggs, if you will. So you mentioned earlier about writing the first book in the Preternatural Chronicles, in in kind of memory of your of your um, friend who passed away. Um, what writing had you done before that? Uh, really, just a lot of short stories, uh, just nothing much. Um, you know, sci-fi stuff, uh, nothing published or anything. It was just, I enjoyed doing it and myself just because it was a lot of fun to do. Uh, so actually I'm glad you're dead is the first thing I ever really wrote in earnest and put out there. And I'm just really uh, flattered that so many people are, are finding it, uh, uh, enjoyable. You know, the, Am the reviews on Amazon, the reviews on Goodreads, um, the reviews on audible, there's so many reviews on audible. So I, I just, I'm really uh, humbled that everyone loves the, the first thing I ever wrote. Because I know for a lot of writers out there, you know, the, the first thing they ever do is kind of kind of a little rough. Like even Jim Butcher himself, you know, I keep mentioning the Dresden Files because it's one of my biggest influences. But he uh, he's done several interviews where, you know, people ask, if you could get someone into the Dresden Files today, well, where would you tell them? He said, you just skip the first three books and that's where they start because he doesn't like them, uh, which I think they're pretty good. But I get where he's coming from. Except that after I heard, uh, you know, Luke Daniels do "I'm Glad You're Dead," I thought, "Wow, this is actually a whole lot of fun." <laughs> so uh, I like it a lot. And so, what was the self-publishing process like for you for <clears throat> the Preternatural Chronicles? Did you try to um, get traditionally published, or did you go straight to self-publishing? So, <laughs> self-publishing, my God, ah, oh, there, there is. My wife says I need to write a book on how to write, write a book after all this is done, just because there's so much more to it than uh, I ever thought possible. Um, I, I half, uh, halfway tried to get published uh, traditionally in the beginning, but really Amazon just made it too easy to self-publish. And um, uh, but there are so many, so many things you learn, such as, you know, you got to do the, the cover art. It has to be professionally done to compete with all the other ones out there, because I think there's like two million authors, indie authors on on, uh, on uh, Amazon, if I recall. So there, there's just so much to it. I, I actually posted a video up on my Facebook the other day where my brain was just fried after dealing with ads and uh, statistics and uh, trying to do this and trying to do that and, uh, you know, planning, planning uh, the pre-orders coming out and the launch dates and uh, all this other stuff. I, I really think being an indie author, writing is only about 25% of the equation. And I'm, I'm learning that more and more as I go. <laughs> and I know that Kindle and indie publishing changes constantly. Is there anything differently that you would do if you were publishing your first novel now than what you did when you first published it? Yes. Um, so I'm very much the type that uh, I, I jump in the deep end uh, with doing a cannonball to figure out if the water's cold or not. I know there's a lot of people out there. Um, you know, who plan, 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 and then they're stuck forever in the planning phase, but they never act. I'm the opposite. I just jump in and see what happens and figure it out as I go. Um, <laughs> the first book I ever published, uh, the cover was, uh, I'm pretty sure, knocking on the door of copyright infringement with, uh, <laughs> with a Batman pose. Um, it had over 200 grammatical errors in it. Uh, Amazon lets you put up whatever you want. 
but and I went through a whole slew of editors by using the service Fiverr. Uh, I really like to use Fiverr, but uh, sometimes you get what you pay for. So uh, editor after editor would come in, and there would still be mistakes. And I finally did something I called the editor games, where I I had I wrote a novella uh, about twelve thousand words, I think, where um, I, I paid five different editors their full fees, and I told them, look, you're going to compete with four other editors, and I'm going to choose the winner. Uh, and the winner is going to be with me for the rest of the series. So may the odds be ever in your favor. And then they went off. And then the the one who caught my attention, uh, her name is Fabiola. She she's just been amazing. She catches the most minute of uh, continuity things. Like uh, I mentioned, one of my favorite bands uh, in the novella, just really briefly. And uh, but the novella takes place in, in 1990. And she came and pointed out, like, hey, they didn't form until 1991. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my, I, that, that'd feel like something that I should probably know. So right then and there, I knew this is the one. And even today, like, I got book five back, uh, what the hell, <laughs> um, yesterday. And I've been working on the re-edits. And just the things that she catches, you know, I'm very, I'm very fortunate to have her. So would I go back and do anything different? no. But at the same time, I sure have learned a lot. <laughs> That's great. So you mentioned outlining the entire series. So what is it like for you when you're sitting down to work on um, a new novel? Do you outline it extensively? Do you write more organically? What's that process like for you? So I've, I've done a lot of research, you know, um, uh, master class where I learned from Neil Gaiman and some of those uh, other really, really popular New York Times bestsellers and so forth. I watch a lot of YouTube videos. Um, you know, some people like Brandon Sanderson will, will plan out a series, uh, everything chapter and outline, uh, Jim Butcher does the same thing. He plans out every single chapter, scene, sequel, scene, sequel, scene, sequel. And, uh, he, he knows exactly what's going to happen in every single chapter. I tried doing that for book one. I planned out the entire thing. And then as soon as I started writing, John went off and did his own thing, which is very apropos actually. So for the, right, what I do now is I use a program called Scrivener. Uh, which uh, Shane Silver's kind of got me turned on to, um, where I can actually plan out some of this is what has to happen. You know, uh, I talked about this in this previous book. I foreshadowed this. So I put up a cork board of ideas, and this is what has to happen. But I don't plan out uh, the story except for I need to know where the uh, climax is in the middle, and I need to know the resolution. And then uh, – I just start writing organically and, uh, and the story forms. And honestly, it works a lot better that way for me. Just uh, the flow of it feels really good. The dialogue is natural because I'm actually, as the writer, I'm watching these guys unfold, you know, before my very eyes. I don't know exactly what they're going to say. I just know, you know, my headspace whenever I'm talking, uh, whenever I put in my, my mind into a particular character um, uh, they just start speaking and I get to see like as a fan what, what they're doing. So, uh, it's actually really exciting to do it that way. I, it's, it's almost embarrassing, but there's been more than a few times where I just burst out laughing after writing a, a section just because of how funny the, the situation was and how, how much of a, a, a snarky ass, uh, John could be to some of the people. <laughs> and, and so do you have any writing rituals when you sit down to work? No, um, I know some people like um, Stephen King says to write a minimum of 3,000 words a day. Um, you know, uh, uh, I don't have any rituals. Some days you feel it and some days you don't. Now, I do try to write um, at least five days a week most of the time. Uh, I, actually, I own a nutrition store uh, called Empire Nutrition. Um, it's located inside of a gym inside of Burleson, Texas. So I actually set up my laptop there. And uh, in between customers coming up and so forth, that, that I usually am writing or working on ads or talking with fans because I try my best to talk to every single fan that reaches out to me on Facebook or email or uh, Messenger or whatever it is. I, I try to interact with every single one because I remember talking to like Kevin Hearn uh, or a really popular uh, audiobook uh, narrator, R.C. Bray, and you know just remembering how it felt whenever they responded to you. So I wanted to do the same thing. I, I try to respond to every single person. So do, uh, my rituals are I just sit down and see what happens. On days I don't really feel it, I try to at least get the, the story out. You know, I, I know this is what has to happen. And then I go back whenever I really feel it. And I can do like the uh, analogies and metaphors and uh, uh, allegories and all that other stuff. Add in the fancy 
the fancy words, if you will. But, you know, on days that I feel it, I can get down, you know, 10,000 words. On days that I don't, it could be 10. <laughs> so so we mentioned earlier about um, uh, audio books. Um, so, and, and I know when we were talking about indie publishing that audio books are definitely – um, up and coming and in a growing area of indie publishing is, are you seeing that with your books? Uh, yes, I've sold, uh, a lot more audiobooks than regular books, uh, or eBooks even. Um, but it's, it, mine's kind of a skewed though, because like I said, I, I do have audible hall of, uh, hall of famer Luke Daniels narrating. So he has his own fan base that will buy whatever he does simply because it's his voice and his performance. And Which can, is why I reached you, out to him. And can you tell me how you got him um, uh, involved in the project and, and and narrating your books? Oh, yeah. So he read the Iron Druid Chronicles, which is uh, one of my favorite uh, urban fantasy series. And he, he just did a fantastic job with all the voices and his performance. And uh, uh, actually, R.C. Bray, uh, he does a lot of sci-fi and military books. And I reached out to him because he's also one of my favorites. And him and I talked back and forth for a long time about him narrating uh, the books for me. And then, cause he, he loved the story. You know, I made a promise to my best friend who, who died and, you know, it really touched his heart. Uh, really nice guy, really nice guy. And, um, he wanted to do it. And so we talked back and forth for a couple months. I sent him the script and then he made a deal with podium Pl- publishing. I think it was where he was booked up for two years solid and it, it's a legal contract, uh, with him and all that. And I, I said, you know what, man, I'm a business owner. I completely understand you do what you got to do. I'm sure they paid you, you know, more than a pretty penny to, to be, uh, exclusive with them. Good on you. So he actually told me like, Hey, this is what you do. So, and I'm going to give you guys the same thing. So any, any writer out there listening, go to a platform called ACX, uh, which is the, it's like a sister company of audible or something like that. But mm-hmm. you can actually see all the different, um, narrators on there you can see their prices for example um you could uh, uh if you want an uh, indie person who's just coming up you can uh put up a script and hold auditions um or for me i knew i wanted either rc bray luke daniels uh, ray porter or uh, mcleod andrew like i had i had a list of favorites that i wanted to go to on this one and i reached out to luke and uh, he did some research on me on amazon saw the reviews I uh, read the story and he's like, "Oh yeah, this is this is my thing for sure. Let's make this happen." So he uh, he gave me a price and uh, I agreed to it. And actually, um, for those of you who are Luke Daniels fans, him and I split the royalties. So we actually make the same uh, if someone buys an audiobook. And I wanted to do that specifically. I wanted to share the profits with him because I really believe and and review uh, readers are agreeing with me on this that. He is giving it his all whenever he's reading because it's not just another book. Done. He's done over 600 books, right? This is not just another one. He's making money on it if he if he does a really good job. So uh, I really feel like he's giving it all his all on his uh, uh, on his performance. As a matter of fact, I just like I said, I approved book three, which is 15 hours long, and that's where the series is really starting to get crazy and take off, and there's consequences and all these. Uh, really big things are happening. And at one point, I was, I was listening to it with uh, one of my best friends, and I said, man, I really think he was crying just then. <laughs> and like, like he just he nailed his performance. And I am, I'm just so impressed with him and so happy to have him uh, be a part of, uh, uh, of this journey with me. So um, for any writer out there, you just go to the ACX website. You know, you can, you can reach out to the famous people, and if they have time, you know, they'll do it. Uh, you can host auditions, you can do all kinds of stuff. And anyone who out there who is a voiceover art, uh, uh, artist as well, you can go there and audition for people and, and make a name for yourself as well. ACX is just a great place and it's very easy to use. Great. Well, what writing advice would you offer for listeners who are writing their own stories and novels? <laughs> so I'll, I'm going to give everyone the same advice that every famous author I've ever spoken to has, has given me. Right. That's it. That's all you got to do. <laughs> now, for a lot of people, like I said, I'm the type that uh, I, I figure out the temperature of the pool by cannonballing into the deep end, right? Uh, there's those out there who are the, the constant planners, right? They're going to be forever stuck in the planning phase. You have to get over that. You have to write, and you have to put it out there, and you have to see what happens and you know, learn, adapt, and grow. But uh, another thing, too, is I have uh, I've published, what, six things? 
So yeah, uh, yeah, six things right now with the uh, book number five in the series come out. So I have like two books are in the series, but one's in the Bella, so it doesn't really count. Another one's book 3.5, which is kind of an Easter egg. It's in the Preternatural Chronicles universe, but it's told from the point of view of the humans where, um, you know, in the series where uh, it, it, it is like Deadpool where a vampire's ripping off some guy's head or he's manifesting a blood weapon, which is another thing how I made it different is uh, I, I got tired of the hiss, hiss, bite, bite that most vampires have done through since the beginning of writing. So uh, I wanted him to be able to exsanguinate his victims in a different way so he can uh, manifest blood weapons uh, like whips, for example. He can make razors go down the form, uh, the length of it. He can uh, dagger or gladius. Uh, then, you know, like stab the bad guy in the liver kind of thing. But what I was getting at is uh, in the series, you know, he'll kill all these different bad guys like cultists or demons or whatever. And, and it's kind of like whenever Deadpool cuts someone in half but he, and he makes a funny comment about it. You're like, ha that was funny. But in uh, Moonlight Equilibrium, which is book 3.5, it's told from the point of view of the humans. So seeing one of your friends get his head bit off by a, a you know, giant werewolf is, is not as funny. <laughs> but um, um, to answer the question, though, um, write and I'm just now I have six things out and it's now getting to the point where it looks like I'm going to be able to do this for a living without, uh, you know, without worrying, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of money on these things because I am Indy. You are entirely 100% responsible, you know, uh, to get Luke Daniels. It was not, um, inexpensive. It was, uh, it was probably next to a house and a car. It was the most expensive thing I've ever done. And I'm glad I have an amazing wife who uh, uh, supported me and, and, you know, let me dip very heavily into the savings <laughs> to hire an Audible Hall of Fame narrator. But at the same time, it's it's paying off. Like the sales are coming in. Uh, he's given an amazing performance. The reviews are pouring in. Uh, there's over almost 300 reviews on the three books on Audible and they're at almost five stars. So people are just are really digging it. But um, uh the best piece of advice is write, write, write. And I think it was even Jim Butcher that said it was at book six was when he could do this for a living. So if anyone out there wants to do this as, for a living, you have to get as many books out there as possible because if you pick up a reader, it's the same thing for musicians. They're not just going to buy the one album they like. They're going to go back and buy your whole catalog. So the more books that you put out, the more um, you're going to be able to do this for a living. But the, the secret to all this is just to write, 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 write. That's great advice. So what books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh, geez. Uh, well, I do audiobooks personally because uh, uh, I suck at reading. It takes me. It took me a year to read it, for example. Now, that is a, a big book, but you know some people can read it in two days or something. And, and I don't know how you do it, but uh, it takes me forever to read a book. So I really like audiobooks. And the narrator has to has to do it for me. So um, I've been listening to the Nate Temple series because uh, he came out with uh, books one through three and then four through, I think it was like six. So uh, I bought those. I've uh, been listening to uh, uh, Craig Allenson. He does uh, something called Expeditionary Force with uh, read by R.C. Bray, which is a, a sci-fi uh, military kind of thing. But it's really funny. It's really funny. Very clever. Um, Sandman Slim is one of those series that I love reading, uh, because I dig the anti-hero kind of, kind of, uh, um, situation and McLeod Andrews just does a killer job doing it. So those are the books I'm reading right now. And where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your books? Well, there's a uh, hunterblaine.com and that's B L A I N. So hunterblaine.com. And then I also have a Facebook page. So Hunter Blaine author. Uh, if, if anyone buys the, the ebooks on Amazon, which you can also search Hunter Blaine, um, at the very end, I actually give hyperlinks that they can click on and go right to either the page, the audible page, the Facebook page, book bub, Goodreads, um, all author. I'm, I'm on as many of those platforms as possible. And then I'm also building my email list too, which you can sign up for, uh, at, um, book funnel, or, or I think on my Facebook, I have it set up and on hunterblaine.com. So that's the best place to reach out to me. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Hunter Blaine, author of The Preternatural Chronicles. Blaine's novel, Mouth of Madness, is available now, so go buy a copy. And Hunter, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much, Jeff. Great. Thanks a lot.
And now stay tuned for a short excerpt from the audiobook version of Book 3 of the Preternatural Chronicles, Shadow of a Doubt. Prologue Water dripped incessantly every few seconds in the dark, freezing prison. There were no windows in Queen Mab's dungeon, so Oberon, the once king of all fairy, had no idea how much time had passed since his imprisonment. Had it been years? Decades? Only the water kept him company. Oberon refused to scream or lash out, knowing Mab would relish any show of emotion. Instead, he sat in meditation, dreaming of what he would do once he escaped. As he closed his eyes, his estranged wife flowed to the forefront of his thoughts, and he remembered. Oberon had danced with the idea of absorbing the unseely court for centuries. Though he had proclaimed himself king of Olferi, he had known in the back of his mind that it was only in name. Everyone had been aware of Queen Mab and her unquestioned rule over half of Fairy. Therefore, the time had come to stop fantasizing over being the one true king. The time had come to attack and make it a reality. No one would dare question or doubt King Oberon, not even in private. Tatiana had argued with her husband over the necessity of the winter and autumn courts. We could rule them better than that bitch sitting on the throne. Oberon had roared in his blinding anger. Tatiana had simply stood with arms crossed and glaring at her husband. Taking a deep breath, Oberon had softened his tone and pleaded, Imagine it. Spring and summer in perpetuity. Flowers would always bloom, while full trees would wave in the warm wind. We can make it that way, wife. There can be no light without darkness, dear husband. We need the winter and autumn, just as they need the summer and spring. It is this perfect dance of balance and equality that gives way to life in Midworld. Who cares about Midworld? Oberon had bellowed, losing what small semblance of control he had had over his emotions. I want that throne, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. As Oberon had turned to leave and prepare his private army, he had been surprised when his opinionated wife had said nothing. Now he knew why. She had betrayed him by warning Mab about his intentions of overthrowing the unseely court. Mab had been waiting, with Tatiana by her side. The loyal army of King Oberon had faltered and kneeled before the combined queens of Fairy, leaving the king alone to face the unseely. Oberon had refused to accept his fate and had battled everything that had been thrown at him. Frost giants wielding ice clubs. Elves with blue eyes and skin casting dark magic, shrieking banshees, and even a cyclops had fallen to Oberon's blade and prowess. It wasn't until Tatiana had stood in front of him as he swung his sword that he had hesitated, allowing for Queen Mab herself to cast the powerful spell that had frozen the king in place. All of Fairy had known about his defeat and subsequent imprisonment. Bitch! Oberon barked through bared teeth. His face was sore from scowling for so long in the darkness. You're going to pay for this, dear wife. Both of you will. Oberon could feel his fists shaking as wrath built a fire in his core that made his skin crawl. Maybe I can be of assistance. Heard a smooth female voice from the darkness. Startled, Oberon's eyes shot open, only to be flooded with absolute blackness. Two amethysts appeared a few feet away from him, followed by a gleaming smile of sharp teeth. Oberon was perplexed at how teeth could shine in the complete absence of light. Who might you be, Spectre? Oberon asked in the tone of someone who was used to being the authority in the room. A humble servant of the one true king of fairy. 
cooed the voice as the smile grew to a full Cheshire grin.